Painting for Peace in Ferguson. We'll have that story next on City Corner. The events that followed uh, the August uh, shooting death, August 2014 shooting death of Michael Brown in Ferguson, surely has affected a lot of people, including our guest today. I'd like you to meet Carol Swartout Klein. Hi, Carol. Welcome to the program. Hi, Steve. Good to be here. Um, does it seem like a year or does it seem like a hundred years since August of 2014? Well, you know, there is a lot that's happened um, and I think what's encouraging is there are a lot of people working really hard to make things better and um, the book that I wrote, Painting for Peace in Ferguson, captures one of those moments that happened really early on. Well, we'll talk a little bit more about the book as, as we go on, uh, but it, it is a children's book, I guess. And I say, I guess. It's, it's really, um, it appeals to more than, than just kids. Um, chose to do a children's book. It's, it, it captures the story of, you know, four days after the um, riots, um, the community came out, hundreds and hundreds of people, to paint up all of the boarded up windows that were just in blocks and blocks of Delwood and Ferguson. Mm -hmm. And, um, a children's book allowed it to be very colorful and to tell a story because really this is what it is. It's about this, a story of the community coming together to heal. And you tell a story in verse. Right. So <laughs> kind of a, you know, just like Dr. Seuss books can be appealing to more than just kids. This is kind of in that same genre. Okay. Uh, Carol, you grew up in Ferguson. That's right. I grew so up there. So you lived there until when? Um, well, until I got married, proud graduate of uh, McClure High School, and uh, my husband and I were married in Ferguson. Our kids were baptized there. So, I mean, this is home for me. Well, talk about home. What was the Ferguson that you re remember like? Um, the Ferguson I remember was, it's a strong community. It was a community, I just went to um, an event at Central Elementary School about a month or so ago, um, celebrating their 135th year. So this is a community that was there long before it was a suburb. And um, the interesting thing about McClure High School at the time is it didn't have to participate in the court-mandated desegregation programs at the time because we had a mixed population. Would that be late 60s, early 70s, something like that? That was the mid-70s, yeah. yeah. Showing my age. I'm not trying to That's add okay. any age That's to you. Okay. <laughs> we're having a big, a big uh, reunion this year, so we're hoping to get our class involved in helping out uh, and supporting McClure. Well, when you were there, Carol, and you, you lived there till you were, you were an adult, um, did you feel racial tension of any kind? Um, you know, I've looked back on this. Actually, when a lot of this happened, I went back and I pulled out my yearbook, and I said, boy, you know, this was this just feels really different. But of course now I think I've I've grown on this journey and I've learned a lot and I said, well, you know, I don't really know what a lot of my classmates were thinking. And I was talking to um, a minister up there um, and he said, you know, we've always prided ourselves on being a mixed community, but um, we realized we didn't maybe know each other as well as we could have. And so I think there's a lot of people working really hard on that. There's a number of groups that are getting together that are just citizens only groups that are saying, okay, we need to, we need to work together. I imagine you still have family or at least a lot of friends in Ferguson? I have friends. Uh, my parents were older, so they're, they're past. They lived there until they could no longer live independently. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, we didn't have an extended family to begin with in St. Louis. So really it's just friends that are up there. Until now. this until the events of Ferguson last year, had you had you 
Did you ever go back there? Oh, sure. Have lunch or something like oh, that? Oh, yeah, yeah. And went up to visit a bakery. It's changed hands now, but I used to go and get my baked goods at holidays up there, you know, sort of keep the traditions. Well, so the events that uh, surrounded Michael Brown's uh, shooting death must have really affected you. What Do you remember that day in August when all the news hit and the, um, you know, all our televisions were full of not positive images of Ferguson. Do you remember that day and what you were thinking? Well, I think like everybody else, you were just trying to figure out what was going on and what was happening. And I think we've, we've really uncovered a lot of the causes. I mean, I, I think what the Ferguson Commission is doing is amazing. I've been to a number of the meetings and, um, you know, they are really trying to look at um, I think Michael Brown, you know, it, it's tragic what happened and that he lost his life, but he was a symptom of a much larger problem. And I think that's what a community we're looking at. So you're saying it was sort of like with that boiling pot of water that nobody notices till it boils over? Right, right. I, I sort of compare it to the match on the powder keg. Mm -hmm. And what we've got to get at is the powder keg. But boy, I guess it's just, um, but it happened in Ferguson. Yes, yeah, yeah. But, you know, as we see on the news, this could have happened anywhere. It could have happened, and it has happened. You know, it's happened in New York City, it's happened in Cleveland, it's happened in, you know, the terrible tragedy in Charleston. I mean, this is a nationwide issue. And, um, you know, the optimist in me says, maybe Ferguson can be the beacon that shows the rest of the country how to work on this. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, you know, again, what I tried to capture in the book, the very first steps of, of what it looks like when a community really reaches out across the lines that divide us to, to come together. All right, so we had the, the shooting death of Michael Brown. After that, there was a, there was a lot of uh, looting and other types of uh, negative activity, activity going on there. When did, when did the artists start to go? So that was what was really remarkable. And I have to do a shout out to, um, Tom Halaska and folks like Gail Babcock and uh, Dana Sebastian Duncan and uh, uh, Mike Lanero. Um, both Tom Halaska and Mike Lanero own restaurants. Tom is in the art bar down on Cherokee, but he was contacted by people because there was also damage on Grand Avenue. So they started there and that happened really first. And there's a lot of artists that lived around there. Maybe I should bring our viewers up to date. A lot of artists came down on the scene and painted up uh, the boarded windows, you know, making them, I don't know, with a message or it might just be painting of flowers or design, whatever it might be. So was that, a, what I'm trying to get at, was that an organized movement? Did all well, these artists just show up on their own? Well, semi-organized, I'd say. You know, I mean, they, they, it was done very quickly, grassroots, really through social media. You know, it was the same kind of phenomenon, actually, that happened with the protests, you know, where everybody sort of heard about everything through Twitter and showed up. And then uh, with um, the painting, it was the same thing. A call went out. And there were even people, a few people, that came in from out of town. We know of uh, a group of four people that came down from Chicago. And I've quoted one of them in the book. And they said it was one of the most um, rewarding things they've ever mm -hmm. done to be a part of this. So what you've done in this book, if you've, you've taken photographs uh, of the artwork these artists did at various locations in Ferguson. And you've compiled them in this book and uh, weaved it together uh, with some, uh, uh, not poetry. A story. A, a story. story, it's a story. A simple story. Right. <clears throat> yeah, just a story to give some, some context, but really it's the art itself that tells the story. Why don't we take a look at one of those images okay. from the book and uh, maybe you can give us a little background on it. Here we go. Well, so this one actually is, um, again, we, because it started in South Grand, we do have some images that were on South Grand. And this one uh, says, and I'm trying to remember exactly what it says, but it says, you know, well- Celebrate a community that favors diversity. Right, and I just thought that was a great way to kind of introduce the book and that that is the goal. I think people were through their art, and what's interesting about the art in the book is that it ranges from simple childlike drawings to really some pretty sophisticated works of art. Mm -hmm. And uh, this artist, obviously, that was their wish. And so they were kind of like public wishes that people had for their community uh, on, again, just on simple plywood. 
Well, it's wonderful that you that you uh, captured, and I think you took some of the photographs, didn't you? I took a few. I hired um, a couple of professional photographers, Michael Kilfoy, Ryan Archer. One of the um, photographers that came down from Chicago is actually a, a Getty photographer, and he, you know, he gave us full permission, but he donated his images uh, to use in the book, so that was a pretty remarkable thing. And one thing to keep in mind is probably, am I right in saying this, that most of the images that you capture in your book probably aren't there anymore? Uh, basically, almost all of the artwork is down. There are a few pieces on buildings that are not currently occupied, um, where they haven't repaired the windows. Could you see an art show someday? I wonder if anyone I saved it. any of these panels. Um, I've talked to the History Museum. They're working on collecting some. They have a few of the pieces from South Grand in the Shaw neighborhood, um, and they're working on getting some from Ferguson. So I'm kind of coordinating with them on, on that because they're big. I don't think they can have a lot of them. But we have a complete photographic record of basically everything that was painted. So, yeah, I think that would be a wonderful thing. Well, I just want to read something in the very first part of your book. Um, and you quote uh, Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers, that everybody knows from TV, right? Right. And maybe you can tell me where, you, where this came from and, and why you decided to use it. Uh, you quote Fred Rogers as saying, when I was a boy and I would see scary things on the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. Well, I was just inspired. Again, I, would, I did not paint. I did not participate in the painting. What I did was tell the story. And um, so I didn't even know this was happening. I went up uh, the Saturday. So the grand jury announcement was Monday. The fires were Monday night into Tuesday. Um, and Saturday, then Thanksgiving was Thursday. And so Saturday, I went up to see what I could do to help. I said to my husband, I said, I don't know what we're going to do, but we're going to go up there. We're just going to try to support small businesses. And lo and behold, there are just hundreds, hundreds of people out on the streets with paintbrushes and paint cans. And I just decided right then and there that I was going to somehow record the story. And I was really thinking, well, how do I tell this story? And is it a coffee table book? What is it? And I, I just stuck, remembered that quote from Mr. Rogers. And I said, you know, these kids had had helicopters going over their house for months. And they've had tear gas coming through their bedroom windows. And I'm sure there are kids that had nightmares. And I thought, this can be a book that can be for them. Let's pick up on that when we come back, because you know how kids handled this, and maybe how adults handled it, too. And then we'll share some more images. Painting for Peace in Ferguson. And we'll be back with more right after this. can save your child from severe tooth pain later. Two minutes, twice a day. They have the time. Same time next week? Well, of course. 
put away a few bucks, feel like a million bucks. For free tips to help you save, go to Feed the Pig. I'm Steve Potter. Welcome back to City Corner. Carol Swartout Klein has uh, compiled the book uh, Painting for Peace in Ferguson. She grew up in Ferguson, and so the uh, the aftermath of the Michael Brown killing uh, hit close to home. Did, how soon did you go back to your, your home, your home stomping grounds after that incident? Um, I mean, you must have been maybe scared to go, <coughs> but wanted to go. Yeah, and you know, there was always a variety of of things happening. I mean, I think um, that whole period, uh, there were protests in various places, you know, and then it would sort of bubble up again and right. then it would quiet down again. But really the, the major damage happened in, in November. And, and frankly, you know, what people don't realize is that, that most of the damage occurred in Delwood, not in Ferguson. Is that right? Yeah. But again, you have to, you know, this is one of the issues in St. Louis. We have all these little municipalities. Right, right. So just to recap, um, what you've done is you had photographs. You took some photographs, hired a photographer, and took pictures of uh, after the, um, the, the, uh, the aftermath of the Ferguson and businesses had been, uh, some businesses had been destroyed and vandalized and so forth. A lot of artists came in and painted the, the wood panels that had covered the windows with positive images. Well, and the, really, the reason I wanted to do this is because I saw just what a transformative effect it had on the community. It really turned a landscape that was just, and a community that was just in shock and just was feeling despair. And to, for them, I talked to some of the business owners and they said, you know, they came in the next morning at 7.30 in the morning and there were already people, strangers they'd never met, that were helping clean up, clean up the glass. And when they saw some of the paintings that people did, they, were, they just had tears down their street face. Let's take a look at an image from the book about some of the paintings that you're talking about. So um, this little girl, um, and again, what was great about it is it was um, kids, it was uh, senior citizens, it was black, it was white, people that hadn't gotten involved before. So this little girl is um, one of the Lanero daughters and they own the Ferguson Brewing and Vincenzo's mm -hmm. and she was just very enthusiastically getting all five fingers in the in the <laughs> paint. It's cute. Let's look at the next one. So this is um, again just the idea that it was black and white working side by side. Um, and it was really, and what I say when I go into schools, um, I ask real, the really young children, you know, kindergarten, first grade, I said, have you ever made a card for someone who's sad or um, is sick? And they said, yes. And how does it make them feel better? And they said, well, it makes them feel better. So that's kind of what this was, painting images of love. Let's go to the next. So this is a really dramatic image, and it was over uh, used a lot in social media in St. Louis. Um, the artist that did the image in the middle of the black and white hands uh, is Anna, Anna Bonfia. But again, as I mentioned, a lot of teachers are really using the book, and one of the ways they use that is to say, well, what was the artist thinking in doing this? Obviously, the black and white hands coming together is obvious. What do the roots mean? Mm -hmm. Why is it in the sky? So it's really an opportunity to teach kids critical thinking about looking at artwork. Let's look at one more. Hmm. So, um, you know, there were a lot of children again involved and it was um, a lot of wishes for peace. Um, there was one artist, Amina, who came and uh, she brought her eight month old daughter with her and put pictures of footprints uh, in, in the painting and she said a lot of people want to go back to normal but what we really need to go back to is a new normal. Well the book's really sort of taken off. It's just been out since February. You're into your second edition now. That's right. And you're, it's going to be, if it hasn't already started, going national? Yes, that's, that's our goal and um, the publication date for the national uh, the next second edition is August 1st, 
Um, and there are some copies already available locally, but that's our national distribution date. And we're really hoping that, you know, as a, it can be kind of a back to school thing for a lot of uh, families and teachers to use in their classroom. Um, teachers have just had great experience with it. Let's look at some more images uh, from the book, Painting for Peace in Ferguson. Carol Swartout Klein is our guest today. She's put this book together. So the blue image there of the um, dog and the cat in the boat is a fun one because um, there were two women that started painting that picture and then kind of ran out of ideas and energy. The other thing that was remarkable about this, not only the effect on the community, but you know the, the volunteers and the painters that came out, it's November, mm -hmm. it's cold. Right. You know, and they're out there in all kinds of weather. So they went home for the night. They had just done the background. They came back and they had sort of run out of ideas. And they came back the next day and someone else had come along and painted the little black and white dog in the same boat. And I think the message here is we're all in the same boat together. <laughs> right, yeah. So um, each of the pieces, as you go through the book, I mean, it doesn't obviously take long to read, but as you go through and look at the artwork, you can really see things in that. And the idea that this was collaborative with people that didn't even know each other, and, it was, and they both made each other's art better. Yeah, do you think most of the artists were not even from Ferguson, right? Oh, no, there were a lot from Ferguson there also. Were. And there were church groups, and there were groups from synagogues, there were families, whole families came out. I mean, it was... Again, in the back of the book, I've got more than 300 names. And I know there's others that I wasn't able to capture. I you know, tried to get as many as I could. And I'm still gathering new names, so. Let's look at some more images from the book. And it's really an easy read, I might add, too. Yes, and it's designed <laughs> for, for smaller children. So um, the, this is one of my favorite images. This is a Mexican proverb. Uh, they tried to bury us. They didn't know that we were seeds. And the whole idea, you know, that after the fires, kind of forests renew themselves, and that what is the good things that are underneath can, can come forward and have, have new life. Um, and there's a new center. In fact, there was a story on one of the local TV stations last night about this center of hope and peace. And uh, the young man standing in front of that is, David Royal, and he uh, lived in Canfield Green Apartments and um, has been very involved, I think, in trying to get this center started. Uh, we had him on this show. He was involved with Cecilia Nadal. Right. Right, who, yeah. uh, who wrote the play Black and Blue. Do right. I have that right? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. yeah, I went to see that. It was a, it was a really great play. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so exactly. So there's a lot of, that's what I mean, there's a lot of overlap, there's a lot of energy, a lot of people working mm -hmm. together to make this better. Uh, in September, uh, the book's going to be featured at a, a book fair in Washington, D.C.? That's right. Congratulations. We, we were really excited. The book has won a couple of uh, national awards. It won a, an IPI, which is from Independent Publishers, uh, Outstanding Book of the Year, one of uh, nine out of 6,000 entries, and then was also selected uh, by to represent the state of Missouri at the Library of Congress's Big Book Festival in Washington, D.C. on September 5th. Let's look at some more images from the book, Painting for Peace in Ferguson. So again, um, you know, the verse here um, that says, you know, they show love's even stronger than the darkest of nights. And I think that um, this is something, it's a message of hope, and that's, these were various places. Some of these were on West Florissant, some were on South Florissant. The um, center panel, the love image, was on one of the restaurants. Uh, it might have been on Kathy's Kitchen. If not, it was right mm -hmm. next door. Let me, let me just read from the first page of your book so people can get an idea of how it kind of flows. In the small town of Ferguson in 2014, some people did things that were meaner than mean. Some people were mad. Some people were sad, but everyone everywhere felt pretty bad. Did you write, did you write all that? I did, and I you know, wanted to keep it pretty open-ended so that families, when they're talking with their children, can talk to them about these issues in a way that's age-appropriate. I didn't feel that I should in any way 
impose what I thought that, that I should let that. And so that was, it was written that way on purpose to be kind of um, open-ended so that families could talk about these issues in a way that's appropriate for their family and for their children's ages. Mm -hmm. Let's go back and take a look at another image from the book, Painting for Peace. So um, this one reads, um, as, they, as they walked down the street, they were proud of their art. And I wanted to put these images of the buildings in the bottom uh, to show how they looked on the buildings. Because it's, it's difficult to just look at the art images and not understand the context. And what was really important is that these, this was block after block. It was in Ferguson, it was in Cool Valley, it was in Delwood. The woman in the upper right hand corner is uh, Darcy Edwin and she painted a picture of a tree that appears later in the book also. Um, and the remarkable thing, if you can see her standing there, she has a tiny little brush, mm -hmm. you know, a little camel hair brush. And she was out there day after day, week after week, and weekends, you know, in the cold. And she painted not only that image, but a number of other ones. And then. Um, on the left hand side is um, Caitlin Moore and she's an art therapist. And so there were a lot of art teachers and art therapists that came out because they know how much art can heal. We, we have a couple more images from the book. Why don't we just run through, through those as, uh, sure. as you and I talk. Uh, earlier, Carol, you kind of made a point about people coping. And have you seen, do kids and adults, have they coped with this in different ways, do you think? Oh yeah, I think definitely. Um, what what is encouraging to me, though, is I mean I think there are some people that are still kind of holding on to anger. Um, what's encouraging to me, though, is that the people that I'm talking to, the vast majority, are really reaching out to each other, and I think that's encouraging for our whole region. Um, I did go to one school actually in the Riverview Gardens district because again. The school districts and the municipality boundaries are all kind of mixed up there. Mm -hmm. It's not like there's a Great Wall of China in Ferguson. And um, the school really did its uh, wonderful job to help the children cope. Well, I want to I mentioned we're just about out of time, but I do want to mention too that you've made some uh, grants available to people, to That's some right. nonprofits in the area. And if people want to donate or if they want information about the book, we'll have uh, information come up on the screen. They can go to the website. Yeah, and this is set up as a nonprofit, so all profits are going to go back up to Ferguson. And the good news is? The good news is that, um, again, I think it's just one step after the other. The community's making progress, and I think people are really responding in a positive way to the message of the book, because it is about hope. I love it. I love the way it looks. I love, I love the read, and I hope people will check it out. Carol Swarthout Klein. And the book is Painting for Peace in Ferguson. Thank you so much and continued success with the book. Thank you. It was great to be here. That's all the time we have for this edition of City Corner. I'm Steve Potter. Thanks for joining us. Come back. Thanks.